Hello, and welcome to Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. I will continue doing something that interests me, something fascinating, something new, something challenging, and hopefully I'll end up in a decent place in life. And today's guest surely does keep busy. We spoke with him a few years ago, and today we'll be doing an update on what he's up to these days. Bhavya Shah grew up in India where blind students were often discouraged from certain studies and careers and where many of his textbooks could not be obtained in an accessible format. We'll talk with Bhavya about how he overcame these challenges and now combines his skills in computer science with his interest in social science to contribute to research projects. But first for our tip of the week. This week's tip comes from Bhavya Shah. I think keeping your options open is the important thing that I would have said, even as an explicit tip. And what a great tip that is. Of course, we can't always do what we want, but if we have lots of options, sometimes things don't work out and we can choose another direction that will make us just as satisfied. Isn't that the truth? Support for Eyes on Success is provided by... Navi Lens, a four color QR code designed to be located and read from up to 60 feet away without the need to focus on it. Now, using augmented reality, Navi Lens 360 Vision locates the Navi Lens codes in a 3D space available for iPhone and soon for Android. More at navilens.com. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Let's start by meeting Bhavya. So Bhavya, you've been on the show before, but that was a long time ago. Can you introduce yourself? Sure thing. It has been quite a while. I am Bhavya Shah. I am now 19. I am originally from Mumbai, India, studying in Stanford, California, currently in Edgewater, New Jersey, so somewhat all over the place, just like my interests. I am an undergraduate at Stanford University, and I am intending to major in some area at the intersection of discrete mathematics and theoretical computer science, but my research interests are in the humanities and social science, so I'm trying to plot those through research assistantships over the summer and throughout the academic year. And I gather you're blind. I am. I am fully blind, and uh, it is as a result of retinal degeneration. I was able to see a fair bit up till the age of 11. Uh, I was nearly fully sighted till the age of five and then my retina started detaching and the doctors reinstated it as many times and to the extent that they could. So I had a gradual vision deterioration process from the ages of five to 11, seven to eight trips to the operation theater. But since the age of 11, I have been fully blind. So apparently you must use a variety of adaptive equipment and braille and screen readers, etc. cetera? Uh, um, I'm not sure. I feel slightly embarrassed to say this, but I am not a Braille user. I did try to learn it when I was gaining my adjustment to blindness skills initially, and I could type it reasonably well, but I never quite got good or speedy at reading it. I was also simultaneously learning assistive technology, so I was trained in JAWS, but since it is commercial and as a price tag, I self-taught NVDA and used that ever since. For mathematical content, I need to use Math Player sometimes and, of course, talk back on my Android device. But apart from that, I'm somewhat low-tech in my approaches to doing productivity tasks in that I try to minimize the number of additional adaptive technologies that I need to utilize. Well, much as I like having a variety of tools, depending on what the task is and which is better, you can spend a lot of time learning and becoming familiar with these various tools. That is true, yes. And NVIDIA is probably the one that I have spent the most time on. And when we interviewed you last time, it was because you and Derek Reamer were chairing the NVDA con that year. 
uh, I wasn't the chair to be clear, but I was helping organize it and the NVIDIA users and developers conference, which still happens annually, was something I was involved in. Eyes on Success is made possible in part by our corporate partners. Underwriting pairs the impact of targeted marketing with the integrity of community goodwill. Learn more by sending an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is how Bhavya combines his skills in computer science with his interest in social science to contribute to research projects. Well, Bhavya, as we mentioned in the introduction, we interviewed you several years ago when you were in high school, and now you're at Stanford as a college student. And I thought we could start out by talking about some of the hurdles you had to overcome in high school. Apparently, none of your books were accessible, for example. So you're used to being proactive and working out things for yourself. Ah, yes. And I think this is perhaps not unique to me. It's unique to many more blind students in developing countries. In the US, you have the ADA, you have more sensitization, you have precedent to blind students in all walks of life. So you have role models and advocacy organizations to look up to. I did have one advocacy organization, the Xavier's Resource Center for the Visually Challenged, and I was able to get all of my textbooks till the 10th grade in an accessible format. Sometimes it was the organization helping me out. Sometimes it was my own mother painstakingly scanning hundreds of hundreds of pages of my books using Kurzweil on a scanner and then manually proofreading those. The real challenge, however, was in my last two years of high school. And this might sound somewhat insane and reminiscing about it does make it seem that way still but I did not have access to any of my textbooks in my 11th and 12th grade, that is to say my junior and senior years of high school in India. The reason for that is that in India, mathematics and science is a set of subjects that blind students are typically discouraged from pursuing. As a result of that, none of my textbooks were available already in an accessible format and to convert them would require resources and time that was much more than was affordable to the organization I was working with or for myself. Therefore, what I had to do for two solid years um, while I studied high level physics, chemistry and mathematics in preparation for a competitive engineering entrance examination was I had to type up the essentials of my textbook manually. My mother, my friends, my teachers would come over and dictate parts of it. And I would have to use my fingers, type them, catch as much and get the practice problems transcribed so that I had what I needed. And it was an effort. It was an exercise, but I've gotten through it and I'm quite glad about it. So you must have had to include an awful lot of equations, uh, chemical formulas, graphs. How did you deal with all of that? The whole deal, yes. Um, again, I did know LaTeX and I had considered using it. However, with the syllabus that I was pursuing, it is the joint entrance examination, the IITs um, for international folks. It's just the very, very top elite technical institutions in India for whose entrance examination, nearly a million kids in India sit having prepared for it for two years, four years, five years. In my case then, I had to write down textual descriptions of graphs in a manner that was succinct because the curriculum was extremely fast paced in a manner in which I could understand because six months later, I would need that material to review to refresh my memory on those topics in a manner that was simple enough for it to be comprehensible to my teachers so that they could correct my understanding whenever they spotted an error in it. So it was quite a ride, but I was again low tech in my approach. I used plain text. I made my own notations for organic chemistry to represent complicated structures in plain text. I use NVDA, speech dictionaries, punctuation, and symbol pronunciations, all of the elementary functionalities of what I already knew to make something quite challenging and multifaceted possible. And just for our listeners that don't know, LaTeX is a method of using text to mark up mathematics so it can be printed in a format that sighted people are used to. That is true. Now, after you 
went through all this science education, which apparently, as you said, was kind of discouraged for blind people in India. How did you wind up at Stanford? It's, again, a journey of me just going with the flow. I had it in the back of my mind. I had this incredible blind student from Delhi whom I looked up to, whom I'd met when I was in sixth grade, who had been to Stanford. And I had realized by my second or third last year of high school, and this belief was confirmed after my attendance to the space camp at the US Space and Rocket Center in Alabama, as well as a debate program at Cornell University, that studying for my undergraduate program and beyond in the United States might really be a good idea. I was not willing to type up my textbooks for three or four more years, even as an undergraduate in India, because I would want to continue pursuing mathematical and scientific subjects. But if those disciplines would be associated with such extreme barriers, then perhaps studying in an environment where accessibility services and provisions were offered, such as Stanford, such as many other US institutions, might be the better option. Therefore, I gave some tests, uh, the standardized testing, SAT, SAT subject tests, TOEFL, whatnot, and filled out my college applications, got my essays reviewed from some really fantastic folks. I am lucky to call my friends and mentors through the debate community that I was part of. And on December 6th, this was a week before what I had thought the early action decision for Stanford was going to come out. I did receive an email, clicked it, checked on my portal. I had got my admissions offer to Stanford. That's quite an achievement for anybody. Stanford, for anyone who doesn't know, is one of the most selective universities, at least in this country and probably in the rest of the world. So you said that your mother was very supportive of you taking all of these science classes. She helped you transcribe all of the books. How did your parents feel about sending their blind son halfway around the world to go to college? My parents are very concerned and care about me. And just like any other pair of parents, they uh, were hesitant about my ability to live independently halfway across the world. But I think what gave them confidence is the fact that I thought I'd figure it out. I didn't really know how I would manage myself either, but I knew that I'd one way or the other work this out. Also, I suppose the fact that I had been alone in different parts of the world, in Singapore and Thailand through debating, in the US two times in the past for the aforementioned summer programs, um, in Qatar for a robotics event and whatnot, I think they knew that I would be able to take care of myself. You've mentioned debating several times, and I understand you're quite a debater. Can you talk a little bit about your debating experiences? I'm impressed that it took you around the world. Sure. So it started back in 2017. I had been doing a few poetry recitation events and model United Nations conferences and prepared elocution, and I kind of liked it. I thought I might be good at it. So I wanted to explore how to take it to the next level. And I just randomly began Googling about the presence of any more significant stature of events in this area. I found that there existed an Indian national debate team and that its trials were coming up in a couple of months. So I cobbled together a couple classmates who would be interested in representing our school and an English teacher to be our coordinator, tried out for the team, made it to the regionals, didn't quite make the cut for even the national round, let alone the national team. But I did develop that interest for this activity. So I returned next year, more determined, more prepared, and somehow I made it through the zonals, through the nationals, onto the national team. And I think that was a satisfying moment in and of itself. But the reason why we had been picked to form this five-member Indian debate squad was so that we could represent the country at the World Championships. The World Schools Debating Championship is the largest and most prestigious debating competition for high school students. In 2019, Thailand was organizing it and it hosted 64 national teams. And we had quite the journey. We faced off in eight preliminary rounds against countries like Peru and Denmark and Argentina and England and whatnot. And we won all eight preliminary rounds and we then qualified to the elimination at the top of the board. And 
in the octos we beat bangladesh on 3-0 pakistan on 5-0 china who were the defending champions on a 7-0 decision and canada who was quite a fantastic team too in the grand finals um it was a, a thrilling debate we won that on a 9-0 split so just the culmination of the hundreds and hundreds of hours of training and coaching and practice and researching and reviewing and redoing that all five of us along with our entire set of coaches and mentors had done that culminating into that announcement of us being world champions i think that was quite the moment i still go back and give back to the indian debate community by doing the practice parts with the current indian team i debate at college for stanford and do some tournaments in canada and the us and otherwise so i think debating has been an increasingly significant part of my life just getting to be on that stage and make a point and capture the attention and make people laugh and cry and move and understand and empathize with different viewpoints is something that i find quite valuable quite impressive and terrific skills to have available to you for other aspects of life i agree debating has in fact cross applied in fact one of the things that i would credit debating with having empowered me to do is in my last year of high school i wanted to give my final school leaving examinations independently using a screen reader on a computer as opposed to relying on a scribe to read out the questions and to write the answers that are dictated and this wasn't a typical accommodation i had to go multiple times travel to ours to the other side of the state to attend the head office and to negotiate my way through even getting 10 minutes to speak with the person at the higher up in charge and i think it was debating that gave me the confidence and the clarity to communicate my requirements and for the fact that a computer could be used as a means of test taking independently to become more normalized in my state through the educational board approving my accommodation well that's a great way to use one of your skills in order to help you pursue your education in other skills. For sure. You mentioned in your introduction that you're studying some combination of mathematics and computer science, but your real research interest is in the social sciences. That's not a very common combination. Can you describe some of the research that you have done and will be doing in your summer internships combining the two sure i think actually the intersection between the social sciences and the computer sciences is much larger than one would initially surmise to give you just a sense uh, over the past two quarters at stanford i've been working with a team of professors from stanford dartmouth and the university of richmond on a ranking of universities across the us based on the commitment to human rights now it might seem like that something for the humanity student to think about and write a list of things that different universities are doing to support or to oppose or undermine or promote human rights but the fact that this data needs to be collected and analyzed is a technical matter which can be simplified with technical expertise this was in fact an interesting story that i should share um we had been hired as research assistants to manually collect data about hundreds of thousands of course offerings across uh, dozens of us universities and the thing about it was that Dartmouth professor who is a professor in quantitative social science had said that web scraping is unlikely to work and therefore we would need to do this process manually. Oh, you must have perceived that as a challenge. Yeah, yeah. And I was going to begin just doing it as prescribed using the manual route. But then an idea struck me and I decided to pursue it. I used the auto hotkey scripting language. very basic nothing too technical about it and i used my nvda screen reader to write an automated script to issue a sequence of key presses that would collect and click precisely what i needed it to do and using that approach even the traditional technologies of web scraping 
could not collect the data from those web pages, this slightly hacky, slightly patchy makeshift workaround to automate much of the process of that data collection worked for me. So it was computer science that was able to collect the data that the social scientists would then need to analyze. But even once the social scientists receive that data, they need to perform those statistical ana analyses on these. For instance, using R and Starter and SPSS and all of these other wonderful tools that computer scientists and social scientists have collaborated to come up with. It's interesting. People are often stuck on using the old methods that they have of doing a task and they're very reluctant to change. But taking a brand new approach like yours and particularly automating a system can make the job a lot easier and more efficient. There's more work up front because you have to put the tools together. But afterwards, not only is it easier, but it's also less error prone. That is true. Something that would have taken me 11 weeks was done within three weeks. And that was thanks to this insight that I had, but also the flexibility that the professor showed in encouraging me to pursue this possibility. What is your current research project? I've been doing a research assistantship over the summer right now with the political psychology research group at Stanford in which I am working on a project about candidate priming. Candidate priming is just a concept of how political candidates can, just by talking about an issue, make people vote on that issue. And you would be surprised that there is little academic literature on the subject. So we are probing some nitty gritties here. Even here, it is crucial for me to learn statistical concepts like OLS regression, to become familiar with languages like R, in order to do this social science research. So that quantitative background continues to play a significant role. Over the winter break last year, I was working with a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford working on his research project about gender violence in India and the response of law enforcement to it. And even there, my ability to use Microsoft Excel to manipulate the data into ways that would make it easier for me to interact it, clean it up and work on it, greatly aided and made my work efficient. So many fields are best done from an interdisciplinary standpoint these days. And this is a great mix of computer skills and social science interests that you wouldn't normally think would combine together. But the world gets to be a big complex place and these problems involve expertise from many fields at one time. I agree. And that's the beautiful thing about an institution like Stanford. You can combine and specialize however you way you like. And what are you planning to do next as you go through your education and all of these interesting work opportunities? That is the trickiest question. I think the simple answer that I give myself is to just go with the flow and never say no to any opportunity that knocks my door, comes my way. And I think I will continue doing something that interests me, something fascinating, something new, something challenging, and hopefully I'll end up in a decent place in life. It sounds like from what you've said of what you've done so far, that pretty much everything interests you. So that shouldn't be hard to find. <laughs> I cannot disagree. <laughs> well, that's kind of my attitude in life also. There are so many interesting problems in the world, and almost no matter what the area is, once you get involved in it, a problem is a problem. And so you just take advantage of the opportunities as they present themselves, and if something looks like fun, go for it. For sure. And that's, I think, my attitude towards life in general. You only live once and there are so many beautiful things to be done. So I have dabbled in writing a blog or composing poetry or playing the flute or being in the marching band in my school or acting in a web series on Amazon Prime or just doing something that seems kind of cool, sort of interesting. And it might be nice to be there doing it as opposed to just seeing somebody else doing it. So why not give it a go? I'm wondering after breaking through all these barriers and overturning stereotypes back in India about blind people, do you think you have changed opportunities for people who might be following behind you who are blind? 
I think so. I wouldn't like to exaggerate the impact that I have had. However, I do see in India a greater adoption of math and science, a greater interest in studying at top colleges, whether within India or abroad, and a greater sense of enthusiasm about how far you can reach. Because the thing about the US is that there are just so many successful blind people that it isn't too hard to find a role model. That is not the case in India. In India, you need to look very hard in order to find examples of blind people who have done things that seemed genuinely impressive. And I think by doing the little things that I have done, I have hopefully inspired some other students through either direct mentoring, through just my story and sharing it to aim higher and to do stuff that they're passionate about. Is there anything else that we missed? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for having me here. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing your time with us. Well, actually, I have one more question. Do you ever sleep? <laughs> occasionally. Occasionally, when I have nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> you are listening to Eyes on Success. 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 Now for this week's final item, how to contact Bhavya Shah directly. Bhavya, if people wanted to contact you and ask questions about your experiences or just ask questions about being a blind scientist or political scientist, how can they contact you? You can contact me via my email address. That's bhavya.shah125 at gmail.com. Bravo Hotel Alpha, Victor Yankee Alpha, period. Sierra Hotel Alpha Hotel 125 at gmail.com. I also have a blog. I don't write too actively. I published one post a few days ago at bhavyasha125.wordpress.com. Or you can just Google hiking across horizons, Bhavyasha. You can also connect with me on Facebook or LinkedIn. I'm all over the place. You can find me one way or the other. And of course, you can find all of that contact information in the show notes associated with this episode at www.eyesonsuccess.net. I want to remind our listeners that Eyes on Success now has a new YouTube channel. So if you do a search for YouTube and Eyes on Success, you can find it. And we're hoping that people hit the subscribe button and we can have even more people subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks. That's it for show number 2136. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be talking about cochlear implants for blind people. Blind people rely heavily on their ability to hear in order to compensate for their lack of sight. But what happens when a blind person loses their hearing? We'll join a conversation between Jim Snowbarger and Greg Green, both of whom are blind and both of whom have cochlear implants, about their experiences with the implants. And that was a fascinating conversation where they talked about the differences and similarities between their experiences. So we hope you'll join us for that next week. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.